Thank you. Thank you very much for having me in this uh, in this historical building with this prestigious society. A lot of very kind, smart people, but kind people here in this audience. <laughs> Hopefully kind throughout my presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about melting ice, and I divide it into three sections um, on how the ice is melting, uh, how do we measure uh, sea ice melt, uh, uh, land ice melting with modern techniques, and what we should do about it. I don't have to tell this educated audience that there's a lot of ice locked up in the ice sheets, about 56 meters of uh, sea level ice equivalent in Antarctica and 7 meters in Greenland. Uh, we like to talk about the change in mass of the ice sheet, the turnover of mass in the ice sheets in terms of gigatons, billion tons. Now, uh, um, there are tens of thousands of billion tons uh, of, of mass uh, in, the, in the Antarctic. Uh, 360 gigatons of land ice dumped into the ocean raises global sea level by one millimeter. Uh, one gigaton is a sizable amount of water on a human scale. This is about the level of consumption of fresh water of a big city like Los Angeles or Philadelphia. But of course, there's a lot more than, than that in the ice sheets. Uh, in, uh, in the Antarctic, we have about 2,000 gigatons falling into snow at the center of the ice sheet every year, densifying into ice, and that ice, when it's thick enough, flows down to the ocean, where it forms floating extensions that we call ice shelves. These ice shelves interact with the ocean, and they break up as icebergs. And there's very little melt uh, at the surface of, of the Antarctic because it's too cold. In Greenland, we have, about, uh, we have less precipitation. We have a participation of the runoff, the melt from the surface. And the glaciers break almost immediately in the ocean into iceberg and interact with the ocean. There's only floating extension in the far north. Now, we know it takes a long time to build an ice sheet, and it takes less time to melt it away. We know that from paleo records. We also know that the last time this transition happened, uh, following the last uh, uh, glacial maximum 25,000 years ago, uh, the rate of sea level rise was not uniform. And there was a particular event called meltwater Pulse 1A, about 14,000 years ago, where sea level was rising four meters per century, and it did that for four centuries. And that corresponded to the collapse of the northern ice sheets, uh, also some parts of Antarctica that have yet to be identified that contributed to that. So right now, sea level is raising, rising about 30 centimeters per century, but we know there's the possibility that it could uh, do this 10 times faster, because it did that in the past, and what causes that is the, is the ice sheets. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, surface melt is, is the immediate picture we have in mind when we talk about melting glaciers, and this is in Greenland. It creates these uh, sup supraglacial rivers of, uh, of water, so we replace a highly reflective surface of snow by a the surface of ice or even water that absorbs more and more heat from the sun. This uh, meltwater is conducted in these rivers that end up in these big holes called moulins. The moulins communicate directly with the bed, and it raises the pressure of the water at the bed, and it's able to lift the ice off the bed and make the ice flow faster. So this, this image of, of the impact of warming on the ice sheet is perpetrated by the media and even our own scientific community, but it's actually a very small participant in the speed up of the ice, because at some point, so these subglacial channels all connect to each other, and the pressure is released, and the ice goes back to rest. And this is not the main vehicle by which you're going to collapse an ice sheet. Uh, the main vehicle of collapse of the ice sheets is what's happening to the rivers of ice, which we call glaciers and ice streams. And when I started this work 30 years ago, we actually knew very little about the speed of these glaciers and how thick they were and where the important glaciers were. Uh, <clears throat> if you take uh, the white Antarctic continent and use satellite data, uh, especially imaging radar techniques, now we start seeing the flow of the ice. The red areas here are flowing faster than the green and brown areas. And you see the branches of the glaciers that are reaching hundreds to a thousand kilometers inland and pulling ice uh, uh, to the coastline where they interact with the most active part of, of, of the climate. So if you want to change an ice sheet rapidly, you have to change the flow of these ice streams because it's one thing to change the melt at the surface, you need to warm up the climate a lot to melt this surface a lot. 
But if you disturb these glaciers, because they tend to be unstable, you can suddenly make them flow a lot faster, and this can be conducive to a much faster rate of sea level rise. <coughs> now, uh, sorry. The glaciers uh, end up in the ocean. Um, oh, I had a little video. Let me turn back here. OK. And they form these, oh, I was not expecting the sound. Can you turn it down a little bit? Um, they create these massive icebergs. This is Elheim Glacier in uh, uh, Greenland. Uh, the iceberg that you see here is about 800 meters uh, tall. This is sped up. It's about a kilometer uh, in size. The glacier is about 12 kilometers in width. This is Elheim, which means the uh, goddess of death, by the way. It's a pleasant name for a glacier. Uh, <coughs> So in the traditional book of glaciology, you learn that glaciers waste their ice by calving iceberg in the ocean. But what we discovered uh, in the last 20 years is that a very important vector of change here, which we don't see with the naked eye, it's what's happening with the ocean underneath. Uh, in the polar regions, uh, the structure of the ocean is very different from the tropics. In the tropics, or even in the coastal areas around here, we have warm water at the top and cold water at the bottom. In the polar ocean, it's the opposite. We have warm water at depth and cold water at the top. And the warm water, salty water, is a very efficient melting of, uh, of the glacier ice. That's why we spread salt on the roads to melt the ice, right? So the, the, the freezing point of seawater is at minus two degrees at the surface. And when you put that water at depth, the freezing point becomes minus 3.5 degrees versus zero degrees for the, for the freshwater ice. So there's plenty of heat to melt the ice at depth at rates in the Antarctic of 100 meters per year, whereas the turnover of mass at the, at the surface is only one meter. But in order to see that, you have to peer down several hundred meters below the surface. The heat in the Antarctic is contained in the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is part of the global thermal online circulation. So how does that change in a warmer climate? Uh, this is pushed by the westerly winds. right? In the current uh, climate, the Antarctic is actually not warming as fast as the rest of the world. The snow cover is the same. The sea ice cover is not changing very much. The depletion of the ozone has actually cooled, uh, cooled the, the climate in the Antarctic, whereas the rest of the world is warming up faster. So you have a greater temperature differential between Antarctica and the rest of the world. And that makes the winds around the Antarctic stronger. Right? And they tend also to contract towards South Pole and because of the Coriolis force, they tend to push the surface waters to the left in the southern hemisphere, and the warm water towards the south, towards the glaciers, and melt the glaciers even faster. And we know this started to happen uh, to deviate from the natural variability around the 80s. In Greenland, we don't have a second polar current. We have the North Atlantic Current, which was mapped by the gentleman who is just behind the screen here for the first time and is looking upon us. <coughs> the water is much warmer than in the Antarctic. Antarctic is about plus two degrees. Here, the water uh, off the coast of Iceland is plus five, plus six degrees. So the melt rate at the base of these glaciers is measured in hundreds of meters uh, per year instead of 100 meters per year. And it took us a while to see some of that because it's really difficult to observe from, from the surface. And even if you are on a ship in these fjords, there's a lot of ice around. It makes it very dangerous to peer instruments uh, below. Now, what's happening in, uh, in Greenland is a little bit different and still a subject of debate uh, in the community. Uh, because the Arctic, in contrast to the Antarctic, is warming faster than the rest of the world. The sea ice cover is reducing very rapidly. The snow cover on land is also reducing very rapidly. The Arctic is warming twice to three times faster than the rest of the world. So there, the temperature difference between the rest of the world and the Arctic becomes smaller. The winds around <coughs> the Arctic, which circulate the other way, counterclockwise, become less strong. The jet stream starts to wobble. And when the jet stream starts to wobble, it does something interesting. The wobbles tend to be stationary for quite a while. Uh, and they the position where they get stationary is guided by topography. So it's not uncommon to see these cold air masses coming along the east coast of the US and stay there for a long time. Whereas in Greenland, you have more uh, warm air masses and warm ocean air masses, uh, ocean masses, sorry, that come in contact with the Greenland glaciers and, and melt them. 
Now, there's another component to that. That's the ocean, right? And the fact that the ocean is not necessarily warming up, but the, the winds are changing and pushing the warm water in different places uh, and affecting the glaciers. There's a part that was known since the 60s and 70s from simple uh, theory, uh, which is related to the shape of the bed beneath an ice sheet. So, of course, it's important to know if the ice sheet is grounded below sea level or not, because if it's below sea level, the ocean can melt the ice. But the slope of the bed is also important. And uh, simple models show that for a normal slope uh, going uphill uh, in the inland direction, if you disturb the glacier from equilibrium, it will find a, a new stable state very easily. But if it's on a reverse slope, there's only two stable states. Either the glacier reaches the edge of the continental shelf, or it becomes a floating ice shelf, which means that if you disrupt the glacier from a stabilizing position because of a bump or some topographic features, in this configuration, it starts retreating along a retrograde slope. You cannot stop it, because ice physics tells you that the rate of spreading of that, of that ice is going to increase with the cube of the thickness, and the thickness is getting thicker uh, as you move inland. Stable, unstable. So uh, we measure the evolution of this ice sheet with a multitude of instruments these days, mostly satellites. We measure the height of the surface, how it changes its time. It tells us where the ice is fitting and when it's not. We measure the speed of the glaciers with interferometry technique so we can monitor how fast they move. And we have the gravity mission since 2002, the GRACE mission, which actually is the equivalent of putting the ice sheet on a scale and seeing how the weight changes with time. Uh, you see that from this data, all the areas in red are melting fast. It's affecting the four corners of the Greenland ice sheet. And in the Antarctic, we see most of the melt happening in the peninsula, in that part of West Antarctica, and there's some hints of things happening also in East Antarctic. This is the evolution of the mass. Um, in Greenland, you can see the seasonal variation in the mass, and the mass loss of about 270 gigatons per year during that time period on average. This is the Antarctic with a lot more fluctuations associated with variability in snowfall on the ice sheet have, with an average of 85 gigatons per year. So the two of them together already rising sea level by one millimeter per year. And then all the glaciers and ice cap, the hundreds of thousands of glaciers around the world that are weighted by grace, losing about 200 gigatons per year. And you also see the seasonal cycle from the Northern Hemisphere. And you can see, you don't have to have a degree in anything to see some curvature in these plots, which indicates that the mass loss is increasing with time. Right? And if you accumulate all this acceleration from the land ice, you see that it's accelerating at 440 gigatons per year per decade. And if you extrapolate that to the end of the century, we raise sea level by 80 centimeters. So you could argue that we are already on a trajectory of a one meter per century uh, sea level rise if this trend continues. This is clearly faster than any models that have been used so far to make sea level projection. And there's a multitude of reasons for that. Uh, one is that we didn't have a good description of velocity and thickness of the ice. Right? The second one is that we don't have a good characterization of the temperature of the ocean around the ice sheets. Uh, some of these measurements in Greenland started just a little while ago. Same thing in the Antarctic. It's very challenging to measure ocean temperature along the coastlines of these continents. There's a lot of places where uh, the sea floor depth has not been mapped. I spent the last 10 years of my life, my life mapping sea floor depth in Greenland. It's a lot of fun because you're the first one to do that. <laughs> right? um, and I'm trying to do the same thing in the Antarctic, but it's a lot more challenging to do that. But we're making a lot of progress in doing that and mapping the thickness. Then the models need to be run at high resolution that defy what the biggest computers on the planet can do in order to reproduce what the glaciers do, what the ocean is doing, and the winds that are pushing the ocean water the way they do. This is not replicated by models currently. So all these vectors of rapid change of the ice sheets are not in the models, even in 2019. <coughs> um, now, a lot of progress has been done with airborne experiments like Operation Icebridge, which started in 2002 uh, uh, for the precursor of, of that uh, uh, expedition. We also uh, launched Ocean Melting Greenland, known as OMG, <coughs> which uh, 
measured the temperature uh, of the ocean around Greenland with probes and collecting bathymetry data. We did a marvelous job in Greenland. We kind of nailed down Greenland. Now the big step is, is to do the same thing in some parts of, uh, of Antarctica. And so where do we stand now? So this is the map of the bed beneath the ice sheet in Greenland and Antarctica, and everything that's in blue is below sea level. That means if the ice retreats in that area, the ocean will follow it through and melt the ice continuously. And some of these sectors have a retrograde slope, which is conducive to fast retreat. So we have three big floodgates in Greenland. The Jakob Savan is very here, the northeast ice stream in the far north with some floating ice shelves, and the Peterman Humboldt system. Well, these three systems together control three, meter, three meters of sea level rise from Greenland. In the Antarctic, there's a lot of floodgates, uh, but I'm going to talk mostly about these two. The Amundsen Sea sector here, which contains 1.2 meters sea level equivalent, but could enter in the collapse of the rest of West Antarctica and its three meters, and some glaciers in East Antarctic that uh, uh, have concerns for some of us. So Greenland, Jakob Savan is very, uh, we treated at this rate for 100 years. This is about 15 kilometers, and this is what it did in the last 15 years. It lost its floating ice shelf. The glacier sped up by a factor two, and in 2012, during a record melt year, it was flowing at 18 kilometers per year, three times faster than the equilibrium uh, rate of the glacier. This glacier is flowing down a deep corridor equivalent to the Grand Canyon with retrograde slope. It's retreating at half a kilometer per year. It's not retreating super fast because there's a lot of friction along the side of this, gla of this glacier to reduce the retreat. But you will not find any glaciers uh, in alpine landscapes or in Alaska that retreats at a rate of half a kilometer per year. Right? They don't retreat at that rate in the glaciers that we use um, to uh, hike around, the glaciers that are easily approachable by humans. In the northeast corner, uh, Zachary Istram uh, lost its ice shelf in the period of 2004 to 2012. It took a little time to speed up, and we didn't quite understand that, but we discovered since that the glacier was anchored on a ridge, and it took a while for the glacier to dislodge from that ridge and start retreating along a retrograde slope. So there again, we have a channel here that's conducive to uh, uh, marine retreat into the interior of Greenland. And then the last gate is the Peterman Humboldt Glacier, where the ice front was very stable until first explored in 1901 by Lange Cock. And in 2010, uh, we saw 35% of the ice shelf disappear in a few calving events, because the ice shelf got thinner and, and cracked more easily than in the past. So not much change there, but uh, the door, the flapping door, we have a flapping door of the floodgate on Peterman Glacier. Now, in the Antarctic, you see that all the big blob of reds here would correspond to high mass loss are concentrated in areas close to the sources of warm water, the Antarctic Second Polar Current. The peninsula, the Mid-Sea Sea Sector, and some sectors here in East Antarctica. Now, the peninsula run a very interesting experiment for us because we saw in 95 the collapse of Larsen A, and in 2002 we saw the collapse in two of Larsen B, which collapsed in a period of three weeks and made it into the movie The Day After Tomorrow, right, if you remember that. And it was interesting to see how the glaciers responded to that. They used to flow at about a kilometer per year, half a, half a kilometer per year. They sped up by a factor three to eight. Right? If you do the same experiment over the whole Antarctic and collapse all the ice shelves, because you warm up the climate enough, and the glaciers speed up by a factor three to eight, you raise sea level by four meters per century. It's a simple mathematical, <laughs> simple calculus that you can do. So I know when I say we can do this, people say it's a little bit foolish to think we could do this, but well, nature did it in the Antarctic Peninsula on glaciers that are not a major source of, uh, of sea level rise. Now the other sector that's very important is the Pine Island Glacier sector in the Amazon Sea. Uh, where well, you have these glaciers here, the Pine Island, the Twaits Glacier. These are big monsters, by the way. This is 30 kilometers wide. Twaits Glacier is 120 kilometers wide, right? between Philadelphia and New York, more or less. This is Twaits Glacier. All of these glaciers, flowing about four kilometers per year, are speeding up in concert. They are responding to the warm temperature of the ocean. In some years where it's a bit colder, they flow a little bit less. 
in years where they flow faster, uh, they flow, um, uh, warmer years, they flow a bit more. We map a lot of the topography beneath these glaciers. Uh, <coughs> we follow their evolution, and in 2014, we concluded there's not enough bumps in the back of these glaciers to stop the ongoing retreat, and we see it as an irreversible retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet. <coughs> Another glacier which uh, has been a source of concern is the Totem Glacier, which on its own uh, holds uh, 3.5 meters sea level rise. It's retreating at 200 meters per year. It's hopefully protected by a prograde slope upstream, so it's going to be difficult for this glacier to retreat fast. But in 2016, uh, the Australians found the presence of warm water in front that explained the retreat of these glaciers. 2016 was the first time we had measurements of the temperature in front of this glacier. So right now we are on a rate of one meter per century, but an interesting result from paleo records is that when the climate of the planet was about half a degree warmer than present, or maybe just the same as present, right, during the last interglacial, sea level was six to nine meters higher. Right? That means the marine part of Greenland was gone, West Antarctica was gone, and some part of East Antarctica, Antarctica yet to be identified was gone as well. It's likely that if we bring the climate system to the same level, we will also commit ourselves to six to nine meters sea level rise. What the paleo record doesn't tell us is how long it's going to take to do that. Right? Damage doesn't start at six to nine meters sea level rise. Right? The damage on us starts at about a meter sea level rise. With a meter sea level rise, a lot of the counties around the US will be affected and people will have to move infrastructure or move themselves. A lot of airports are within a meter sea level rise. I always take the example of San Francisco because I usually present that at AGU. We don't have any airport with a one meter sea level rise in uh, uh, San Francisco. The irony of the melting of ice sheets is that uh, next, next to the ice sheet, sea level is actually lowering because the crust is rebounding, the gravity field is changing. Even though these ice sheets may seem far, remote, and irrelevant to us, they're actually rising sea level faster in the mid-latitude regions than they do in the tropics. Now, what do we do about this? Uh, one issue is to communicate the risk and uncertainty. And a problem we have in the science of looking at climate change in the polar regions is that people tend to be conservative about what they see. Uh, when you forecast dire future, you don't look like a very serious scientist. If you make a projection that's more conservative, you look like a more serious scientist. It's a very difficult thing to deal with in the case of, uh, of polar ice sheets. So I have a little bit less difficulty with that because I'm a little bit more rebel than others. And because I have my nose on these data for the past 30 years, so I see all these things happening day by day. But it's, even in our own community, we have trouble uh, dealing with that. So the Band-Aid solution is to adapt, right? Uh, and either move or protect. In the societies that can afford to protect, we will protect. In societies that can't, they don't have the technology of the money, they will have to move. And the cost of doing all of this, of course, escalates in an exponential fashion with sea level. It brings, of course, a lot of safety and ethical issues because uh, infrastructures like nuclear power plant are at risk, airports, navy bases, but also sea level will, uh, will affect poor populations the most. Right? And instead of having massive immigration from violence in what we observe today in the present world, we can have massive immigration caused by climate change, and we're going to have to deal with that. So forget the Band-Aid solution. This is just a bad medical experiment that we need to unplug. So we clearly need to avoid the commitment to a multiple sea level, uh, sea level rise. And I think we've seen enough uh, in the climate change signal, in what the glaciers do, to say we don't want to go there. We don't want to run the experiment until the patient dies. Right? And the time is to do that is to do now, to transition to a carbon-free energy. It's available. It's economically viable. The challenge is to do that rapidly and to do it worldwide, which means that Countries who don't have this technology should have access to this technology as well. We need to curb our greenhouse gas emission, uh, but even that, in my opinion, is not going to be enough. It's, of course, the first major step to do that. 
uh, but we already passed some threshold for some of these ice sheets. So if we really want to bring it to a level where sea level is not rising because of melting land ice, we're going to have to deal with the extra carbon that we already put in the atmosphere and need to sequester back into the ground. And my last sentence here is a little bit philosophical. It might sound a little bit like a motherhood statement. I apologize, but we are in the American philosophical society, which is great. I love it. Uh, I, the vision of all of this is to have a world informed by science and not by Twitter <laughs> that produces cleaner energy, cleaner air, cleaner water in a sustainable and equitable fashion. Who doesn't want that? Thank you. I'm a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Steve Berry, University of Chicago. Is it possible to estimate the, uh, w when there might be a critical point with the, that's irreversible? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, a lot of us look at uh, tipping points, right? Yeah, tipping points, exactly. Uh, the unfortunate reality of climate change is that uh, we are very good at recognizing tipping points once we pass them. <laughs> Um, so I think in Greenland we passed them. Uh, we, we started to disturb the marine based glaciers in, in an irreversible fashion. And I think in West Antarctica in 2014 we made the announcement that we thought this retreat was irreversible. So the tipping point is, is behind us for some of these systems. But there's a lot of tipping points, right? Uh, the biggest tipping point, in my opinion, is if we start destabilizing the glaciers in East Antarctica. Then if we, if we do commit to that multiple meter sea level rise, that's, that's a really bad thing. Yeah. Philip Kitcher from Columbia. Um, I, I wanted to ask you something about something you said at the very end of your, oh. um, of, of your talk. You talked about uh, bringing some of the carbon that's already been emitted into the atmosphere out of the atmosphere. Uh, yeah. And I, I have read reports of some sort of prototypes for devices that would do this. There's a Swiss company that apparently has managed to do some of this on a, on a small scale. How realistic do you think this is? Is there any, any, any serious hope for uh, a vacuum cleaner that will pull the carbon out of the atmosphere again? Yeah, no, that's a very good question, and I'm not an expert on that. Um, uh, sometimes when I have a question like this, I say, you know, plants do that every day uh, on a regular basis uh, uh, and, and suck up carbon much more than we would need. But uh, then when you talk to plant ecologists, they say, well, you know, uh, be smart about this. Uh, show me how it can happen. How are you going to plant trees? And, and, and it, So it's a little bit of a challenge. I think I see that as... Uh, the new sort of challenges for new generation scientists. So there's a lot of very exciting problems to deal with uh, in that respect. Uh, it's probably less challenges to produce clean energy. We know how to do that. We're doing that. Uh, carbon sequestration, that's a very interesting problem. But nature shows that it's possible. It does it, does it every day. You know? If I could just add a little bit to that. Yeah. The, the, the National Academies have come out with a recent report, it's about, about 200 pages or so, about various technologies to try to take out carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere. Also, uh, they involve technologies where you capture carbon dioxide coming out of the smokestacks from from power plants and then, and place it under underground. So, so these technologies have 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 been proposed, but we don't have enough examples to see if they actually work. And they are economically viable as well. Yeah. Right. <coughs> now, please identify yourself, Philip Gingrich, Ann Arbor. Could you say something about orbital cyclicity and where we are in the planetary cycles and the effect of that on, on warming? Yeah. Uh, 
in addition to well carbon. so yeah that's a that's a very good question so uh, we should be going into an, a new glacial age right now but but uh, there are forces at play that are stronger than that and it's, it's us <laughs> right and uh, because we are warming the planet so rapidly uh, forget the background uh, natural cycle uh, the change i think i think the the, the most uh, interesting part of, of looking at these ice sheets for the past 30 years is to realize how fast they are responding to climate change. We expected this to happen on millionaire time scales or even on centuries, but it's happening much faster than that. The system is very sensitive to the climate. Bill Brinkman <coughs> from Philadelphia. Uh, to what extent do you feel that the, the debate has changed on the on the larger medium, in the sense that I still hear attacks on modeling. And if you think about your data, it's, modeling is almost irrelevant. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very modeling well. Modeling is almost irrelevant. And your data is very factual data that exists, right? So the debate sh should be shifting away from models at this stage. I'm curious whether you feel it has. I, ca I can't hear very well. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry, am I not getting this close enough? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, is that better? Uh, the question is. Are, is the debate about uh, climate it, is shifting away from attacks on the models? Uh, it, because of the kind of data you're presenting, it's, it's clear that the models are relevant. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, he was asking if the, if the modeling is shifting away from being relevant. Oh, the, the, yeah. the modeling shifting away from being relevant. Is that the question? The models, uh, how well the models away are from modeling and claim in the model, worrying about whether the models are accurate enough as a predictor, or are we really using your data saying, hey, the, the real pro the world is telling us it's, it's changing, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question, but uh, if you're talking about the reality of models, of course, we want models to be better because that's what we need for projection, right? And it's, it's a big challenge. Uh, we're making progress. I think for a long time the ice sheets were left in models. You're shaking your head. This is not what you're asking. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Final question. Yeah. My question is similar to the last one. Okay. Good. <laughs> Jerry Ostriker. Um, my understanding is that the ocean rise is accelerating at present. There's a positive curvature to the change. Yeah. Um, is do the computations give that, and or are they behind in in uh, accounting for the actual accelerated sea rise? They are behind. Derivative. They are behind because they, they don't get what's happening on the ice sheets, right? None of the none of the global cl climate models right now are able to replicate what's happening in the Southern Ocean. Uh, the uh, increased circulation of the winds, the water being pushed. Uh, towards the Antarctic continent. They can't even do that because the description of the bathymetry along Antarctica is fundamentally bad. So there's some fundamental limitations also in the models from the fact that they don't have the right boundary conditions. So a lot of the um, plugs in the system that are the vehicle of rapid changes of the ice sheets are unfortunately missing from these models. So these models are, are by, by, by design conservative into projecting the rates of sea level rise. And unfortunately, in the context of sea level rise, we don't care about the minimum sea level rise scenario. We don't even care about the mean sea level rise scenario. We just want to know how bad could it be. We want to look at the tail end of the system. And for that, you need to make sure to have a good understanding of all the processes that can land to this extreme scenario. Uh, one example of that is the rate of fracturing of the ice, the rate of production of icebergs. This is a big unknown in glaciology. We don't know how to model that. It seems pretty simple, right? Ice cracking up. Uh, we have people dealing in this room with problems that seem far more complex than that. Uh, the dilemma that we have here is that we have been relatively poor in observations of these processes to really inform models on how to do that. But things are changing, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, these problems will get solved pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.